You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach, and this is Five Things That Make Life Better. You know, we're living in a golden age of documentaries. I find myself watching them and gravitating to them on um, TV and cable, and I'm pleased that filmmaker Liz Garbus is with us this week. She has been a director who's been taken seriously right from the get-go, and she has almost 35 films or maybe a few more to her credit since then. Uh, Perhaps her most decorated one was What Happened to Miss Simone, which was released in 2015 about Nina Simone. It was nominated for an Oscar and won an Emmy for Outstanding Documentary. Her newest release, All In, The Fight for Democracy, is on Amazon Prime, and it's about the relentless determination of the right to suppress votes in this country, in the South and also in the Southwest. It stars, if you can say a documentary stars someone, Stacey Abrams. She is plugged in right into the zeitgeist. She just completed a documentary about Mayor Pete Buttigieg and is executive producing one about Dr. Fauci. She is one smart cookie. Now, this is a wobbly time we're experiencing. And when I say we, maybe it's just me. Indulge me for a second. We're allowed to go out more. We're supposed to feel quite hale and and confident with our vaccinations, but yet be mindful of the new variants and the fourth wave of COVID infections and fatalities that are inevitable. What does it mean exactly? It's such a mixed message. And actually, I don't feel ready to confront the world at large. I'm surprised by my own reaction. I don't feel comfortable eating indoors. I don't yet feel like going to anybody's house. So many interesting articles have been published recently about our collective malaise, which is now mixed with a huge dollop of anxiety. And it's affecting our friendships. Some, they write, won't survive this at least year-long hiatus between seeing friends Others have formed very strong friendships that have probably flourished during this because of, you know, being deliberate about staying in touch on the phone and Zoom and FaceTime and so on. So I am starting to see some friends again, but outdoors, and it feels wonderful. There, It still feels a little risky. I'm not sure why the silverware, you know, I'm sure it's fine. We're not going to catch COVID from it, but you never know. It's going to take time to be fully at ease, I think. And now another thing is clothing. What are we supposed to wear? I've forgotten what to wear. I've forgotten what I liked. I've been wearing the same thing all the time. My old, maybe ancient, dance go clogs. By the way, they were chewed up by my previous pet, Henry. I wear them with jeans, a t-shirt, sweater, jacket. Unimaginative. This could be with many facial and body changes, me in 11th grade. This could be me in college. This could be me writing a book at home. This could be me now being a grandma. This is ridiculous. I have such a total lack of imagination, except for the masks. I wear good masks, but otherwise, I mean, I either look like me in high school or I look like a 14-year-old boy. Take your pick. 14-year-old boy with large breasts. (laughs) I'm confused. I've gained some weight. I have to work on my habits. I've learned to bake. So now, you know, my pantry is dangerous. I don't know. I think if I found an outfit that I felt good in, I would feel better about going out, but masked and with my little spray of antiseptic spray and antibacterial spray. So anyway, while I'm thinking about that and you're thinking about a 14-year-old boy with large breasts, here are my five things that make my life better. Number one, and this is really a big number one, it's President Joe Biden. I think he's doing an outstanding job. You know, I'm not even paying attention because I don't feel I need to, but his head is down. 
He has put together a team of the most talented and appropriate staff for the really large changes he's making, the large moves that could really help average Americans. I believe in what he's doing. I like that he's not hogging the screen and that he's just doing his work. And uh, I think we're very fortunate. Number two, French wine. I have felt like I have put myself in a little hole of Rioja and Malbec, and it's time to explore other countries that produce wine. And I'd heard that France was one of those countries. So I'm moving off from my pandemic grapes, and I tried a Cabernet Franc, which I liked quite a bit. It felt deeper and more, I don't know, silky. So I'm going to continue my scholarly approach to other wines. I'll keep you posted. Number three, this has been a big part of my week. It's watching the puppy play with other dogs on the street. It didn't really start happening until the last week. And now our dog Sheila loves fooling around with other dogs, big ones, small ones, fluffy ones, Almost none of the owners ever introduce themselves by name. It's always the names of their dogs. So I will say, I don't remember all the names, but Brooklyn, Lulu, Marty, Lucy, Teddy, Henry, Daisy, we'll see you again soon. Number four, Lauren Zelesnik, the superstar of the media world. She was a film producer, then she worked at VH1, then she ran Bravo and created The Housewives and a lot of other reality shows. And she's now kind of an emeritus figure in a lot of places on many boards. Really, she's got it going on. But for about a year, she has curated a weekly newsletter. She calls it the LZ Sunday Paper, which is a cool roundup of stories you may or may not have found that are woman-centered. It's cool. I, I never miss it. I may not read every piece in it, but I read it every single Sunday. And I have a link on my website at lisabernbach.com where you can sign up for it too. And number five is a wonderful piece that I found in this week's LZ Sunday paper. It is a photo essay from the Washington Post about a woman who dresses, an 82-year-old woman who dresses for her Zoom church services every single Sunday. And she is stunning. Her name is Laverne Ford Wimberly. And I promise you, if you see her pictures in her outfits, very color coordinated, you will be a happier person. Coming up, Liz Garbus. Don't go away. I'm really thrilled, actually, is the word to describe this interview because Liz Garbus is such an amazingly prolific filmmaker. Also, you seem to have your finger on the pulse of everything, Liz. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I just watched your, I was going to say your newest film. I'm not sure that's even true anymore, but it was your newest when I watched it all in the fight for democracy, which is so of the moment because it's all about voter suppression. And it's a jaw dropping experience watching it. It reminds me that we don't teach civics in this country. Yeah, no, it is. It is my latest film. Lisa, you're correct. Okay. <laughs> came out in September. And yeah, I mean, it is a tour through our history. And of course, albeit an abbreviated one. And I think the major takeaway is, you know, everything old is new again, as we right. find ourselves right now in this crisis, you know, with these laws being passed, of course, a lot of focus has been on Georgia, and rightfully so, where we really focused our story as well. Yes, exactly. I mean, your movie, a documentary doesn't have stars, really, but yours, if it did, you would say it stars Stacey Abrams, who is just the perfect leader for this. I mean, she's the most eloquent person imaginable, and she has uh, sort of achieved saintly status, or at least heroic status, over the last few years in getting the vote out in Georgia. It's just incredible, the hypocrisy of the system which you point out in the film, and that a lot of people knew, which was that Brian Kemp, who is the governor now, 
was the Secretary of State in charge of verifying and counting all the votes when he ran against Stacey Abrams. Right. There's something there's something <laughs> fishy there, right? Yeah. It doesn't take a, a legal degree to see that there is some conflict of interest <laughs> there. Right. It's it's incredible. Also, yeah. you know, your footage of John Lewis and Martin Luther King crossing the Pettus Bridge and all that, it's it's important that we watch it, even though we've seen it or in the back of our minds, we yes. know that there was a protest once that crossed that bridge in Selma. What is so remarkable to me now really studying it because I knew I was going to be talking to you was how the protesters simply, they weren't screaming, they weren't chanting, they weren't holding up placards, they weren't being hostile. They were mildly, but in giant numbers, just walking. Watching that was, was actually painful to understand that. Yeah. I, they were walking, you know, but also, according to the, you know, the testimony of Vester Andrew Young, who we right. interviewed in our film, you know, they had some sense of what they were walking into. And, um, you know, well, when, yes, for sure. And the yeah. sheriff was very predisposed against them. But nevertheless, it was just walking. It was just walking. You know, and earlier, Martin Luther King, and, and we talk about this episode in our film, Martin Luther King had gone to LBJ and had said, you know, we need voting rights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and LBJ said, I just don't have the political capital. We, we passed the Civil Rights Act. I don't have the political, I can't go back for more. So King and his colleagues understood they needed to build the political will. And the political will was built during that march across that bridge where the whole world saw what you're talking about, which is, you know, just people linked arm to arm in protest of, you know, for access to the ballot and getting beaten for that. Uh -huh. um, and that the outrage, as that was televised, was broadcast on television and creates the momentum for change and gives LBJ the will that he needs. That was very fascinating. That was like a lesson in law passing. Even the president just didn't think he could go back to his Congress again for the voting rights. And he didn't say, please do this for me, but they did it and they understood what they had to do. Yeah. And, you know, I think about this moment that we're in right now where we see Georgia passing these laws and Arizona passing these laws. And, you know, we have a Voting Rights Act, as you know, from the film, or if you don't know, if, you know, if you're listening, you know, we the Voting Rights Act was renewed by every president, even the Republicans, Reagan, Bush, etc., mm -hmm. until Obama was elected. Well, of course, Obama was going to renew it, but then a case was brought to the Supreme Court called Shelby versus Holder, which essentially eviscerated the Voting Rights Act. And that was in 2013. So we've been seven years, eight years without it. And there is a renewal of that act, you know, sitting in Congress, right. which was rewritten to address the Supreme Court's issues with it. Um, and unless we get rid of the filibuster, that too shall die. And, and I do think this is a moment like the moment of the march across Selma Bridge where we're fit, we're at a crossroads for our democracy. And if we can't get through the filibuster, if we can't get H.R. 1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act passed, you know, we are in serious trouble. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I guess what we're all understanding as attentive citizens is that democracy is something you can't take for granted. You have to protect it. And having a democratic president and having a barely democratic majority in the House, it's just not enough. It's not enough. And the hatred of the other that was unleashed by the last administration has taken so even though in my heart, I believe that Donald Trump himself will be too busy defending himself in courts mm -hmm. over the next few years, and I, you know, we can talk about that, to run for president again, which makes me laugh. He didn't even like being president. It's just a power grab. But the people he influenced are out and out racists. By and yeah, large. yeah, I mean, and, you know, I saw an, an editorial piece today where somebody said, well, what's wrong with having fewer voters? I mean, a lot of people are ha saying the quiet part out loud now, 
Yeah. Which is what happened under Trump. Well, maybe people who don't have education, you know, to, to figure out how to get an ID shouldn't mm-hmm. vote. You know, these kinds of things. Right, right. Which are anti-democratic. <laughs> and so I don't know if it makes it better that they're saying the quiet part out loud. It doesn't seem to be. But that is what happened. And that's what's happening all around the country as, you know, the suppression is on. It's on in Arizona. It's on in Georgia and other states as well. Right. And it's, you know, and I think a lot of people say, oh, voter ID, what's the big deal? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that is something that we unpack in the film, which is that, you know, it may be a seemingly benign requirement. Right. But every state has these laws that says, well, this idea is allowed, but this idea isn't. Right. And for instance, in Texas, a gun license lets you vote, but your public housing ID does not. And that's a very clear example of how voter ID can discriminate. And the truth is that there wasn't voter fraud. And this is all in response to this, you know, so-called, you know, these all these laws around voter ID, et cetera, et cetera, are around fighting voter fraud, right? Right. But it just doesn't happen. And um, we find ourselves like kind of living in this upside down. Right. Where there are all these laws being created to combat a foe that doesn't exist. Right. And it's really, you know, the history when people read about, I mean, it's just really quite something. It um, is quite something. And, and the fact that there are people who will stand up and say what we now call the big lie that Joe Biden stole the election or isn't our legitimate president or or something like that. There are two Americas. And the question is, how will we ever, ever be able to speak to one another? I did a sort of interesting mental exercise. <laughs> I was walking, taking a walk the other day with my husband. And I was thinking, you know, I'm trying to get in the headspace of those who are propounding this lie, this big lie, like you said, that, that Joe Biden is not legitimately elected. Because, you know, after 2016 and 2017, I said, he's, you know, I said, oh, Trump is not my president, or he's not legitimate. And I right. tried to sort of say, is there an equivalent <laughs> here? Like, my rejection, or I believed, you know, that the Mueller investigation might turn up more than it did, or, you know, whatever the things were that, that I believed that might prove Trump's illegitimacy. I sort of wanted to do a mental, you know, sort of weigh this. At, can I understand them? Because my guy lost, you know, or my woman in that case lost. Right. And it's very hard to <laughs> find an equivalence there simply because, you know, of the majority of voters. And look, I, I know this is not how our democracy works, but there is righteousness in the fact that, you know, more voters voted for Hillary Clinton, more voters voted for Joe Biden. To do, to say, to kind of twist yourself into a pretzel to sort of say that Joe Biden wasn't truly elected because there are 20,000 votes in Georgia. Well, you still have to go further than that. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was thinking about Trump and his legitimacy, it also does come down to the Electoral College being a remnant of slavery and a remnant of trying to uh, give the Southern states more power um, at that time. And of course, you know, Trump was elected legitimately through the Electoral College. Was there propaganda out there? Was there voter suppression? Yes, but he was elected. Did Russia interfere? Yes, he was elected. And the fact that Hillary Clinton didn't spend the first six months of Donald Trump's presidency saying it was was illegitimate and you know there needs to be a recount and so on also shows you there's a reasonable way to behave and then there's something else that was unleashed and has become an alternate code an alternate way of assimilating news an alternate way of thinking about <laughs> the facts, or as Kellyanne Conway so memorably declared them, alternative facts, which of course, the minute someone else said, use that term in a sentence, it sort of even validated that that could be a thing. It's not a thing. There's no such thing as an alternative fact. That's fantasy. Right. Of course, Hillary conceded and, you know, there was a peaceful transfer of power. Transfer of power. Yeah, that was not questioned. And, you know, sometimes a lot of conservatives, you know, back to Stacey Abrams, where we started, said, well, Stacey Abrams refused to concede when she had fewer votes than Brian Kemp. And the real difference there, well, there are many differences (laughs) between Stacey Abrams not conceding and Trump 
not conceding. One major difference is that she acknowledged that Brian Kemp will be the governor. There will be a transfer of power that she would not fight against, right? That that transfer of power, what she was going to fight against was what she saw as a disenfranchisement of her fellow Georgians. So it wasn't actually about her so much because she wasn't trying to get back into the governor's mansion at that moment. Although right. hopefully in the future she will, um, but right. you know that, that. But that it was about the system itself, and also unlike Trump, she then brought lawsuits which were successful. <laughs> right. She brought the right. To the courts and showed how the lines in Fulton County were X versus the lines in um, majority white counties. Um, right. Talked about the voter, talked about exact match, the problems on those, the problems with the provisional ballots, and she won. And many lawsuits. And by the way, that's why the election in Georgia in 2020 was so robust. Right. Right. And now, of course, that's why we're here looking at these laws where they're rolling back. And one of the most, you know, people talk a lot about not being able to give water and lines to people. It's terrible. But, you know, the most frightening thing is sort of taking over the oversight of election boards. So if there were bad actors in an election, they could overrule local boards. I'm not saying that very well. But there's a lot. No, of I understand what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. I guess another thing about Stacey Abrams is, as I watched her in your film, she's, I mean, this is not an equivalent in the Trump world. She's a hard worker. My oh, God, yeah. you see her and you see an overachiever. Oh, yeah. And I you mean, see somebody. Yeah. yeah, from day one. Liz, it was so poignant to hear Stacey Abrams talk about the day she went to the state capitol by bus with her parents to receive recognition as valedictorian of her high school. Yeah, it was an incredible story, rich in metaphor, that starts off the movie of the inevitable biopic of Stacey Abrams' life that we will all see. You will say, it didn't really happen. <laughs> It's almost right. It's too on the nose. (laughs) Too on the nose. It's too unbelievable. I guess the question is does the movie start there or does it start at the end of her many terms of being the governor of the state? Or when she's elected president, you know, we're there maybe. Or when she's elected (laughs) president. Wow. Does she? Okay. Well, first of all, the story is that a white officer, a security guard, did not want to admit her and her parents beautifully dressed, did not want to admit them to the reception that was partially in her own honor and didn't believe that she could be a valedictorian and didn't believe that they belonged there. What a message for someone to get. So hardworking, such a good person with parents who worked so hard to give her and her siblings a good life and a life filled with good acts, as we learned in your movie. If that doesn't motivate a person, I don't know what would. Yeah. And, you know, of course, the irony of it being her, you know, deserving to be in the governor's mansion, but being denied entry is lost on no one. On no Um, one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they had gotten off a city bus. They didn't have a car. And, uh, you know, all these factors that went into this guard's judgment of them. And, you know, there was a list of every valedictorian in Georgia. He didn't even want to look at that list. Right. Because he was so sure that he could discriminate against them and humiliate them enough for them to turn away. Which, you know, Stacey says, like, she actually just wanted to. She didn't even want, but her father insisted that they gain entry, and they did. And if you're a 17-year-old girl, maybe you don't believe you deserve to be there. You're a 17-year-old Black girl in Georgia. Uh, you know, it could do Stacey, a number on your head. Yeah. Yeah. One thing about Stacy that you don't have to know her too long to get the sense of, you know, she is one of the most supremely confident people I have ever met. And, you know, one of the stories that doesn't make it into the film, which is a great story, is how when she's in college, she makes this Excel spreadsheet with, you know, goals and deadlines for herself. You know, the goals and really? everything from, you know, having a boyfriend by such and such an age and also <laughs> becoming a lawyer by such and such an age and then, you know, being president by such and such a year. So this This was a young woman of extraordinary poise and confidence. But of course, you know, you can't deny that the effect that these have on her, these experiences have on her informing who, who she is today. 
Now, um, she got to go to the Ivy League. She got to have this extraordinary education. And the setbacks that she's experienced, I see, make her stronger and more determined. Is she somebody who still wants to run for president eventually? Oh, I think, you know, I think Stacey is enormously ambitious in the best way and, you know, enormously qualified. I know that she was the leader of, in the Georgia House, the minority leader in the Georgia House. Right. And she does want to move into an executive role. I mean, when people suggested she run for Senate in Georgia, of course, we now have, you know, Senators Ossoff and Warnock. But when it was suggested that Stacey run for one of those seats, which, you know, given the profile that she had, would have been a, a really good race for her. A very possible, yes, it, very good yeah, race. Yeah, it would not, it was not something she wanted to do. So she's not ambitious because she, you know, to just get any job. I, you know, Stacey, I believe, wants to be an executive as a governor. And of course, what are other executive positions, you know, president yeah. or vice president? Right. I think we will be observing an extraordinary future. And we would all be lucky if she, you know, because she's just one of the most remarkably competent, connected, focused individuals I've ever seen. Wow. Well, it comes across. It looks like she puts on her dress a swipe of lipstick and she's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. I don't her, know if that's her, true. Or her but, suit. Yeah. yeah. No, she's no, she's something. And you know, I've interviewed a lot of people and you sit with somebody for three, four hours and by the fourth hour their sentences, like I'm sure mine will be after half an hour here, become a little less articulate, a little more circuitous. But you know, her focus four hours in is as sharp in the first hour. That's what I mean about, you know, sort of somebody who has just an extraordinary intellect and sharpness who mm -hmm. you'd kind of want at the table making her decisions. There's a kind of calm and poise and resolve yeah. that's just instills such confidence. And results. She has the results to back that up. The thing that I, I don't know if people realize about Stacy is, you know, everybody saw what happened in 2020 in Georgia. In Georgia. That state, that state turned blue. But what happened when Stacey was minority leader in the House, what happened in 2010 was she said, we have the power, she was a Democratic leader in the state house, to turn Georgia blue. There are so many voters who are not coming to the polls. They don't feel they have candidates they want to come out for. They don't feel the process is for them. We have to change that. And in 2010, she saw the future. She saw what would happen in 2020 and her belief in it, in the people of Georgia, in their desire to get involved was so extraordinary. And it created, of course, the, the democratic the wave. Uh, yeah. the weed. And I just think that that is somebody in a league, that kind of vision and playing that long game is really just something that's so incredible to see in a leader. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea. I know what she I, has emails where she writes in 2010, like, I believe if we do this and we do this and we do this work, and she understood it was going to be a decade of work, that this was the future, could be a future for Georgia. She understood how disengaged people were from politics and how they mm -hmm. needed to be engaged and be given candidates who spoke to them. Do you think that the last four years created a kind of political awareness and engagement that wouldn't have happened if we had had a president who was capable and competent and emotionally normal? Well, we were polarized and pol that energizes both sides. So right. I think that's true, but it also energizes the other side too. I mean, that just, you know, we had enormous turnout on both sides. Right. No, without a doubt. But it does feel, and I wouldn't call it a silver lining because the suffering is immeasurable yeah. and it'll take a long time to get over it. But nevertheless, people watch the news, read about politics in a way that I have not seen before in my lifetime. I think that's right. But I think that what happened in Georgia was more door to door and retail than just about Trump. Right. You know, right. I think it was really about this 10 year work of knocking on doors and talking to people and meeting people where they were. And also Stacey running for governor. And she was a candidate that people in Georgia that people came out for. You know, she talked about her brother's struggle with incarceration and addiction. I mean, she represented a kind of leadership that spoke to people where they were and the yes. kinds of things their families were facing. So well, you it, it a, makes yeah. total sense that somebody was not a voter in maybe a small town in Georgia. Why not? Because their grandfather had been beaten up on his way to the polls. That was a family story. That was the way it was. I'm not going. 
I don't need sure. that trouble, right? Sure. And the fact that you might have to wait three hours and who has time for that? And, you know, right. all those other factors that might keep you home. Right. You know, and also the fact that in some ways there weren't candidates who were speaking to the issues in their lives that mattered to them. Right. Um, and I think that's been changing in Georgia for sure. Um, let's pivot a little to your career. You were almost out of the gate from college, kind of an important filmmaker with your Uh, early work with Angola, The Farm. That's not overstating the case, Liz, I don't think. Yeah, I made The Farm. I worked with another filmmaker named Jonathan Stack. And yes, I was in my mid-20s when we started. And I spent three years going down to Angola, following the stories of what ended up becoming six men. And it was about life behind bars. It was about how do you make sense of a life when you know you're going to, you know, you're wake, you're waking up and you're going to be buried 20 feet from that spot. Um, right. You know, it was about the effects of long-term incarceration on the human soul. Um, and also, of course, on the justice system, you know, we saw people go through their parole board hearings, we saw somebody go through being executed, you know, we saw the way that the system worked. And I think that, you know, certainly that was the film that, that launched my own career. And it was for me also a very, you know, an experience that really focused me on what I wanted to do when I felt like I had to say as a, as a filmmaker. Well, when I think of the breadth of your films, going from a farm, going to Nina Simone, uh, Stacey Abrams, I think Dr. Fauci, you're working on one with him. I'm an executive producer. I am not directing that film. So it's a very Uh, different kind of role. But there are two great directors, John Hoffman and Janet Tobias, who are directing that film. But I'm so lucky to be a part of it. But you get to be sort of knowledgeable in all these different areas that fascinate you. Yeah, you know, it's funny as I think about, you know, you mentioned before, yes, I went to Brown and, you know, you design your own major, you can design your own major at some of these colleges. I think about how in sort of being a documentary filmmaker, and I've also, I've also started doing scripted work too. And in mm-hmm. that, in that area, you get to kind of design your own major, you know, every year. Yeah, where you yeah. Like, like, okay, I now am going to take a deep dive into the history of the franchise in the United States or, you know, and I've also done you know, the, a lot of the films that you mentioned are social justice oriented films. And I've also done a lot of a lot of films with female protagonists and also dealing with, you know, crime. And um, that's an area that, that interests me a lot as well. Do you feel like it's a form of activism, your film work? Um, I think... Um, because you certainly inspire people to become active when they yeah. watch your films. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, what I what I need to accomplish when I make a film is to tell a really good story. And I always want the story to come first. And even in a film like All In, which is, you know, very much an activist film, right? I mean, there's an argument right. in that film about expanding the right to vote. You know, I hope we told a story. Maybe that story was about America. Maybe that story was about Stacey Abrams. But that story that had a very satisfying, you know, beginning, middle and end. Yes, So I think it's a question of, you know, balancing entertainment, storytelling with issues that matter to me. But I guess it's for other people to decide whether it's activist. I suppose if it activates them, then it is, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, activism is also, you know, showing up and marching and, um, you know, all those other things, you know, volunteering like, like you know, you were talking about and and to get voters out. I mean, that's real activism. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't diminish what you do. It's all in as a very important movie. I want to make it very clear that America, in my opinion, our educational system, including at the private schools that my children attended and I attended, I don't think they did a good job teaching us about American government unless I was absent or asleep or doodling, I don't remember it. And I think we learned basically the length of a term of office of a senator or governor, a congressperson and the president. But I don't think we understood what a fragile, exquisite thing our democracy is and how rare it is and how much we need to do to keep it going, which would include throwing out the filibuster, which might include rewriting the Constitution if that were ever possible. And it made me, honestly, your movie made me want to read more about the Civil War. So I appreciate that. And I'm grateful to you for that. 
Well, thank you. And I agree. You know, I've shown this film at high schools from the most elite, you know, privileged schools to places where people have experienced that kind of voter suppression firsthand. And, right. You know, I think even from the teachers, there's a feeling that there's a real lack of tools. You know, one of the things we wanted, and unfortunately, the film is 90 minutes, so it's not so easy to use in the classroom setting. But we really wanted this film to be accessible if you were 14 or if you were 50. And I think, you know, hearing from the teachers that I've heard from, it, it is, you know, it is a very useful tool. Well, and it makes you want to vote. That's for sure. It makes you, if you're a high school student, I'm sure watching All In makes you want to register the second you can. Um, It's time, Liz, for your five things that make your life better. Okay. All right. Okay. So I had to think about this. And I mean, it's obvious. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's obvious. My first one is just so obvious. And, you know, it's just a gimme and everybody has to say it. But, you know, the things that make my life better my two children, Amelia and Theo, my dog, Bowie, and of course, my husband, Dan, Um, you know, those are four things that I'm going to put in one slot. (laughs) Because those are really the things that make my life possible. Mm -hmm. And okay, and then I'll go on to some other things which are slightly more idiosyncratic. Um, I love mystery novels. And I love the Irish mystery crime writer Tana French. You love it. I just it's just like I just sit there waiting for the next book and like I will tweet at her. I will do anything I can to get like I'm like, when is it coming? When is it coming? They give me such joy, such escape. They are so smart, yet have every delicious kind of like, you know, mystery thriller, crime novel, you know, delivery drug that I, I love and live for. <laughs> so if, if, if you're like me and you just love that stuff, then I would certainly suggest you go check out Tana French's books. Tell me something. Are all the books set in Ireland? Yes. Yep. So is there a moodiness and a do you smell a pint of Guinness or something while you're reading it? Absolutely. And especially in her latest one. I mean, she spent a lot, there were a lot of uh, of her novels were set in Dublin. And unfortunately, I say a lot, there aren't actually that many, there are not enough. I mean, she's not one of these people who writes a book a year. I think she has six books. or Damn her! Yeah, right. Sorry. (laughs) But they're so good. I mean, they're so good. I mean, she's such an incredible wordsmith. But, you know, a bunch of them are have some repeating characters in Dublin. Um, and they're the sort of Dublin murder squad as they investigate. And then there are some that sort of have break off characters you might have met in another book, but you're totally focused on them. And then the latest book, which I think is called The Searcher, is more in the countryside with an old American um, man who's retired there and stumbles across a murder, uh, a missing person in this town that has you know changed the DNA of the town. But yes, they're very descriptive. And, um, you know, that you fully get into that world, the gray, you know, the, the concrete in Dublin, and you feel it and you feel the lilt of the language and some of the expressions. Fantastic. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. Boy, you sold that hard. Okay, By the good. way, you also directed the series based on the open case for so many years that the writer Mich- Michelle McNamara. McNamara was pursuing she was married to Pat Oswalt, and then she died very suddenly, and it was picked up, and you made the documentary about it. It was a documentary TV series, right? That's right. It was a six-part series that aired last summer on HBO called I'll Be Gone in the Dark, and that was a tremendous joy working on that series. Um, I mean, obviously, a tremendous darkness, right? But yes. The- Working with the archive that Michelle left behind, getting to know some of the survivors of the Golden State Killer. And then he was actually found thanks to her deep investigation. Isn't that right? Well, she certainly was part of an investigation and she spurred it forward. Uh And she, of course, as you mentioned, passed away. And that investigation continued until new kind of DNA technology helped unlock the identity of this killer, um, Golden State Killer. And it was actually on our first day of shooting. We were in Chicago. We had just finished shooting with some of Michelle's family. And he was arrested that night in the middle of the night after we went to bed. It was the craziest oh, coincidence my- of timing. But you know, there were so many extraordinary women and some men, you know, survivors of that crime spree who we got to know, you know, getting to know Michelle posthumously was amazing. I mean, talk about a great writer. So that was a real joy to work on. And, and uh, it is there on HBO. Yes, I'm going to watch it. It sounds fantastic. Okay, number three. 
Oh, okay. So number three is something that provides so much enjoyment and laughter for both me and my children is on Twitter. His name is Darth. So it's just at Darth, D-A-R-T-H. Right. And what Darth does is he pines on politics and he does this or that. But what I go to Darth for the content that I create is basically Darth rendering verdicts on naughty dogs. So (laughs) if you might post a picture of your dog, you Uh know, who has ripped apart the packaging and all the things are on the floor and you post a picture and you say, Darth, look what my cute pup did or whatever it is. And then Darth will say, that puppy is innocent. Look at that boot there. He obviously chased away the robber who did this. And I'm not doing, <laughs> I'm not doing Darth any justice, but I have to say it, it provides. And then also I just go there and I can look at cute puppies. In any case, Darth provides an enormous, and we were very, Darth hibernates every year. He hibernates over the winter. Uh-huh. Um, so we were very concerned that he wouldn't be back in time to weigh in on Biden's dogs. Um, oh. but, but he has thankfully been weighing in on Major Biden and his escapades lately, which has been really important for me to wrap my head around the Biden dog situation. And Well, that is a situation <laughs> that is very concerning, <laughs> very right. concerning. And what does Darth say about Major Biden? Well, you see, Darth is a bit of a knee jerk dog defense defender minded. yeah so darth takes major's side it's all in good fun because i don't want to joke about somebody actually getting bitten by a dog it's not funny but um it, you know when you follow darth you'll see his point of view on how maybe the humans around major biden might be a little training but major is innocent but uh, but, but Darth tends to regard dogs as innocent because they are kind of innocent <laughs> That's right. some, some of them may not need to be around people all the time but yeah. um, in any case darth provides a lot of entertainment and enjoyment and um, for if you're a dog lover i think you might uh, well might excellent to, i'm yeah. going to, i'm gonna go over there okay number four um so number four one of my, my happiest places is um, a pond that's called ice house pond uh-huh. which is in massachusetts the pond in massachusetts and it's fresh water and um i will go there and i swim and i love and my husband does too i love fresh water swimming and we get to go there over the summer and it's just like it's really really quiet you walk down a very long you can't park there you have to you know park sort of far away and then you walk down a, quite a long path and even at the height of summer there's maybe one other person in this pond wow and just that, is, it co- know, is it cold when you get in it's not freezing. I mean, it's not freezing. And you never touch the bottom. It's not like that pond that some people might remember from camp where you like, ew, you know, yeah. it is like you <laughs> yeah. can climb down. There's a dock that's built out. You climb down the ladder and you're in, you know, deep, gorgeous, spectacular water. And, and you just, you're just, you just feel alone, but you're 10 minutes from civilization. And there's nothing that changes my day than sort of going and swimming for 40 minutes or something and coming out. And it's just the best feeling. Oh, how wonderful. Wonderful. And the final, number five? Oh, yeah. Number five, Settlers of Catan. Oh, yes. Okay. So when my son was maybe nine or 10, he was given a game, a gifted game called Settlers of Catan, which many people know. And, you know, it took me a long time to wrap my brain around it and learn it. It's very hard to learn. Yeah. Right, right. It is very hard to learn. But now four or five years later, when my son is a bit over it, and it would prefer to be doing other things. Right. I have to sort of beg him. And in fact, what he does to play, and of course, then we have to recruit, recruit other players because you can't just play with two people. Right. But what he has started to do, because I beg him so much, is for my birthday, he will give me tickets. And so he gives me tickets so that at any time that I want to play Settlers of Catan, you I, can can redeem redeem, a ticket. I can redeem the ticket. So it's my birthday on Sunday. Oh, I've used, I've used congratulations. All, thank you. I've used all my tickets for my last <laughs> birthday. So I'm hoping I get some more tickets so I can force him to play Settlers of Catan with me. Now, when, but of course you need to recruit other people, but maybe yeah, people my, feel on your birthday that you're entitled to a long game. That's right. I definitely like guilt, guilt my husband into joining the game. And my daughter, you know, she's completely uninterested, but I can generally force people into my game sphere. Um, but I, I do, I do love that game. And in fact, I love, I love board games in general. I'm pretty much always up for a good board game. Well, and this year has been a very good year for board games. 
That's right. And puzzles. Yeah. And puzzles. Very, yeah. very good. Yeah. Yes. And, and your family's doing puzzles together too? We did a lot of puzzles. Now we're more about the board games. It's hard to find the space for the puzzles, you know, that you're, there's a table that you're going to like not eat on for X amount of time. Uh, that's a exactly hard. right. It is exactly right. And the floor, if you have a dog, it doesn't quite work. So, right. yeah. Right. So the game, right. the games, uh, the games fit into life a little more easily. <laughs> you can, yeah. you can at least push it aside to one <laughs> end of the table it's so yeah. true it's all about the logistics it's all about the tabletop right. it's all about a table <laughs> right and for those of us who live in new york you, we don't have just like spare tables lying around right that's right that's right <laughs> you, by the way have you seen puzzle tables there no. are people who are dedicated so much that you can get a puzzle table which has little leaves where you can put the loose pieces Oh. And they have, and they're lined in like velvet so that they cling so that there's a little, mm. there's a little, well, it's something to think about. It's probably available at Hammock or Schlemmer or something. <laughs> I would <laughs> love it, but you know, you need the space for that additional table. Which well, that's know, also would, true. Yes. Yes. But I, uh, you know, maybe when my kids move out, I'll have more space for a table. Oh yeah. You could, <laughs> you could turn their rooms into a puzzle room. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't no, think so. I think well, hopefully they'll be coming back. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Liz. It's been a real treat. And the movie is called All In the Fight for Democracy. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been two-time Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker and also Emmy Award winner, Liz Garbus. You can see her film All In the Fight for Democracy on Amazon Prime. You can follow Liz on Twitter at Liz Garbus or Instagram at Liz F. Garbus. My blog is at lisabernbach.com where you'll find links and photos to all the things in this program. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Spresso Rucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, please wear a mask and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.